a, a very clear and systematic method of sort of judging, assessing the nature, the internal dynamics, the dynamism of you know actors in this case, right? And based on actions A and Y, it is very clear and it has been decided without any ambiguity that X is the result, Y is the result. These are some of the very, very simple things that you can do, and I'm just using this as an example, and I didn't prepare anything, it's just like off the top of my head. But the idea is I, I'm able to arrive at probably some truth, right? I don't know for a fact that it's true because I haven't talked to any legal theorists. I'm sure I got a ton of them watching me and they'll correct me if I'm wrong or tell me that I'm right. But the idea is we have to ask what are the conditions for the possibility of X, whatever that is that we're trying to assess. I know absolutely nothing about legal precedents at all. I, I don't read law books, right? Um, not that I don't like law books, I just I, I do so many other things in my life I haven't had time to really get into it. Though it, now I'm thinking about precedents, I might want to read up on that. But the idea is, and I'm sure you know, political theorists, not political theorists or, or, or you know, lawyers, JDs will, you know, guide me and say, no, this is, this was your assessment was fine. The idea is, I can think about, and I can posit the question as an epistemologist, what are the conditions for the possibility of this representative class, this representative case, this instantiated specific thing with which I can generalize across the board, right? If, if this thing is that unique, and I recognize that the uniqueness of this thing, X, whatever that thing might be, conceptual, objectual, what have you, then the question becomes, what are its conditions? What are those characteristics? What are those conditions that must be satisfied in order for this thing to have meaning? Right? And that's the question. Once you, once you know the question, then you can go about sort of conceptualizing answers to it, as I just did uh, in, a, in a demonstration. So that's the social science explanation off the top of my head, but you get the idea. Okay, number three, quote, it must be shown, I mean, I don't want to run out of ink here, um, it must be shown or explained how, right, it must be shown or explained how it is possible for us to know things about the world given that the sense experiences we get are compatible with our merely dreaming. The idea of how is in um, italics in the original obviously not the underline or the bold, but how the author Stroud stresses how in italics in the original. So the emphasis was in the original. Right? It must be shown or explained how it is possible for us to know things about the world. Right? The question is how do we know things about the world? Right? And this is a more advanced epistemological question for those of you who understand the various aspects of epistemology, correspondence, theory of truth, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to jump into that now. Right? Now is not the time for that. But just very, very generally, um, I, the idea is there is a tree, there is a tree in the world that looks more like a flower. Okay, so the tree is just turned into a flower. So, so there's a flower in the world, and the idea is that the, the flower projects sense data towards me, the fragrance of the flower, the color of the flower, the height of the flower, the look of the flower, the feel of the flower, what have you, what have you. That sense data impresses itself upon my cognitive capabilities, and then I have the idea of the flower. And then we say that the flower itself, this is super, super general, right? And I'm also not saying that this is necessarily true or false, I'm just saying that this is an obvious sort of gut interpretation of how we come about ideas. Remember, in terms of representative cases, it's going to be a little bit different and a little bit more difficult to understand exactly how we come about that, and I'll talk about this in a second. So the idea is that there is this flower, the flower impresses itself via sense data on our faculty of sensibility, that impression makes us have a corresponding idea, so that this idea corresponds, right, it corresponds with the thing, right, there is a correspondence between the idea and external reality, in terms of metaphysical reality. Right? So that my idea of the book, epistemology book, and anthology there on my desk, corresponds with the actual book. I can verify this correspondence by actually picking up the book and, oh yeah, that's right, it does correspond. Right? Descartes complicates this by saying I could hallucinate that, for example, he doesn't, he doesn't really say that, but I can dream that. And insofar as I dream that, that correspondence is, is off. I've done another lecture series where I talk about the function of the the dream, sort of dream analysis, and not necessarily psychoanalytic terms, 
but um, the Oneric Rebus, dreams as interpretive aspects of something deeper, that doesn't really apply here. What applies here is the relationship between sort of the ontological, metaphysical existence of reality as such. And that is, to be clear, to be clear, right? I want to be very clear, right? Mind at this level, right? Mind independent. Right? Mind independent reality. Meaning that if every single human being dies today, all this stuff still stays here. There would obviously be no epistemological means of validating that everything is here, but we're talking about an existence of real. There, are, there are other arguments for this now, right? But at this level, we're talking about the existence of the flower as mind independent. That is, the flower exists independent to the perception of the flower, right? The existence of the flower is independent to the perception of its existence. That relationship, however, if there is perception of its mind independent, and now we're getting actually a lot deeper. So I hope you follow along. And I hope I haven't been going too deep. I feel like I'm going too deep today. But if there is a perception, which is contingent, right, because people might not exist, but if there is a perception of this mind independent flower, then that perception yields, via our faculty of sensibility, that perception yields the idea of the flower. The idea of the flower corresponds with the objective reality of the flower, and thus we have this relationship. Right? So, you get the idea. The question is now, in terms of generalizing from class-based representation, we recognize in a very difficult sense, however, that there are ideas that we have and we can't quite identify these ideas in mind-independent reality. What in the world does that mean? I'm going to give a very controversial example that I won't explain, just because I think it would be fun to see what happens by me putting it out there. But here it is, I am a person, and I, the person, have the idea of capitalism. And the question is, where does that idea of capitalism exist as a mind-independent faculty in reality? The point is, well, first of all, we, we immediately know it's not going to be mind-independent because capitalism is itself a product of the mind. So a very smart epistemologist would say, hey, Dr. Campbell, that's not really fair. You can't really ask that question. I can still ask that question. I would just augment it a bit. Another person might say, where, where is the idea of the number three? I have the idea of the number three, one, two, three. And I can validate my idea of the number three. This really does become Cartesian. One, two, three by counting. But of course, as we know, um, there could be a malgene that always deceives me every time I count three, such that you know um, one plus two really equals four. Blah blah blah. I don't like getting into that stuff because it gets too sort of way out there. I like keeping it rather simple. The idea is I have an idea of three. Where is the mind independent? Um, verification of three in the world. This takes us into a huge sort of realist, nominalist, this takes us into a whole discourse and, and many other, uh, there's more mathematical um, discourses on sort of the validity of numbers in a mind independent universe, but that gets really sort of abstract. The idea, and now I want to return to a more, a more nuanced mathematical point, the idea, I hope I'm not going to too deep, but hopefully this makes sense. I hope you're following along. It makes sense to me, but I hope it makes sense to you. Uh, I've been a, I'm a little rusty. I'm like three, four weeks not shooting videos. All right. So the idea then is we want to understand, as an epistemologist, very very simply, what are the conditions? Like what needs to be satisfied in order for me to identify this phenomenon, this thing, in social science terms as a representative class or a representative case or a representative instance with which I can then generalize, right? With which I can then generalize across the board. Right? That's what's at stake here. And the question is exactly how do we do it? Okay, so the first thing then, 
the first thing then, and this is very important, this is key 